Now, <clears throat> we've had a, uh, a wild few weeks. We moved one of our daughters seven hours away, and then we moved ourselves after 30 years. That's an upheaval. A couple hours down the road. Then we moved two of our kids, another seven hours. Then we turned around, got in the plane, went to England. We were in seven churches in 25 days. Once or twice I woke up in the middle of the night and didn't know where I was. And we got back at midnight on Monday. We rested for a couple of days and came down here. And so, uh, but, I, uh, but Doug used the word available, and I think that's a great word. It's one thing that Elaine and I hate, and that's sitting around doing nothing. We just can't stand it. And uh, I know we will have some priorities and already have some priorities that the leadership has given to us, uh, and we obviously will honor those, but we are available for you. And, you know, let me tell you, this is the second service. We can stay here all day. So <laughs> now you regret you came. Uh, you wish you got up earlier. Well, let me tell you a little story about availability. About three years ago, Elaine and I were uh, in City Church in Newcastle, England, which is a church that we've known for many years. And uh, the pastor a a asked us if we would be available. And, well, we said, well, of course. And so he took us literally and opened up uh, our time to anybody whatsoever in the congregation. It was a large congregation. We arrived to a spreadsheet that was about nine days, nine o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. And, uh, but we went through it all, and there was one name on it that we didn't know who this was, and the pastor didn't know, none of the elders knew. Nobody knew who this lady was. So I said, well, that's interesting. How did she get on this list? And so when the day came for her to come for counseling, this lady came in, very grace, graceful lady, and... Uh, this was her story. She was uh, from Paris, France. She was uh, a Muslim, raised a Muslim of Arabic background, but she got saved. And uh, she'd fallen into the hands of an extreme prosperity teaching, which was almost like a cult. Even though she was a senior executive in a large international corporation, you would all know the name of it, uh, and very highly paid, she was living in poverty because these vultures had drained her of all of her money. And she was in bondage. And in desperation, she cried out to God. And God came to her and spoke to her in a dream. And in the dream, he said, I will send you two prophets from Canada, and they will tell you what to do. And the following Sunday... She walked into the doors of a church that she'd never heard of and knew anything about. She'd never been in the building before. She walked through the doors, and she sat down on a chair. And as she sat down on a chair, my friend Ian, the pastor, had our picture up like that on the front. And he said, next week, David and Elaine are coming from Canada, and anyone that wants to see them, sign the sheet. And so she signed it, and she came. And that day, as she met with Elaine and I, she was totally and completely set free. And I remember at the end of the session, she pulled her checkbook out. And I said to her, and because she was French-speaking, I said to her in French, I don't want your money. She looked kind of shocked. I said, no, we're here to give to you. She never heard that concept before. You'd think it might be Christ called Christianity. <laughs> and we, w we m went back a year later, and she was still there in the church until she was job transferred somewhere else. And, her li and it was just because we were available. So you never know what God may do. Well, we move in the supernatural, don't we? And the Holy Ghost is in the house this morning. Did you notice that? And so let's expect God to speak to us. So you can expect God to speak to you. Don't, don't tell me that God can only speak to a few people. 
That's the first lie we'll address this morning. It is a lie. Did you know that the devil is a liar? We know that. But did you also know that whether it's like the old cartoons where he sits in your shoulder, he sits pretty near to it, and his constant mandate is to whisper in your ear. That's far more damaging. Sometimes we fear, the devil will do this to me. No, the worst thing the devil does to you is the whisper in the ear, and he does it constantly. So we're here, and one of the things he says is, you can't hear from God. Only special people can hear from God. Only the odd person or whatever. That's a lie. That is a lie. It is a lie. It is a lie. It is a lie. Yes. Amen? Yes. We all agree on that? Yes. You, and let me tell you something else. You all do hear from God and you don't even know it. Yeah. Every time, now you would agree with me, I think, that if a very sinful thought comes into your mind, that that's the devil speaking to you. Right? Well, what happens if a loving, caring thought or direction or a sense that you should do something which really is honoring to God comes into your mind and you go out and do it? God just spoke to you. You didn't think of it that way, but that's the voice of the Holy Spirit within you. So, you know, the, the little boy Samuel had God spoke four times before with Eli's help he figured out it was God. When I first got filled with the Holy Spirit, and I had a very powerful encounter with God, and I started knowing things that were going to happen before they happened. But it was four times over two weeks before finally it got through my thick head. It was actually God yeah. speaking to me, not just a coincidence where something remarkable happened. And so come with me into this place because we need the Holy Spirit. Right. We really do. And so, good. If, I could quit right there, and it would be worth it, but I won't. <laughs> uh. Now, let me read some verses from Ephesians chapter 3, and this is a prayer that Paul prayed. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may, strength, he may grant you to be strengthened with power. So I'm talking this morning about the release of God's power that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and height and length and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. It's amazing, amazing words. Now, there's five points in this message, and I've got notes that I've sent to Matt so you can read them. But there's five points, and they're easy to remember. The first of which, and I'm talking about the release of God's power, because the Holy Ghost is in the house this morning. The release of God's power. The first point is this. It's the gift of God's power. He says, I'm praying that God may grant you to be strengthened according to the riches of his glory with power. It's the desire of God that you be strengthened with power and through the riches, according to the riches of his glory. God is not a cheapskate. He isn't. God wants to give you the very best. He gives according to the riches of his glory. Now listen, God is no man's debtor. There is always enough in God's supply for every one of us. God, we, we were the friend in England who had an extremely expensive car. I tell you what, Breno, you would, Breno, pay attention. You would have liked this car. This car was so expensive that uh, even though it was unlocked, nobody could get in except the owner because his fingerprints were the handle would I, of the car. Door handle would identify his fingerprints. Have you ever heard of that? And so when he, when he flashed his fingerprints... Under that door handle, all the doors open, the rest of us could get in. I think there's something about Jesus on the cross in that. God saw the fingerprints of Jesus on the cross, and we all got let in. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. But I tell you what, what a car that was. Yeah. Man. My point is this. God didn't empty his bank account. 
when he gave my friend that 700 series BMW. There's still enough left for a Honda Civic for me. <laughs> Fingerprints or not. God only knows how to give richly. He comes to you only one way, as a giver. It doesn't matter what your need is. It could be financial, it could be emotional, it could be physical, it could be spiritual. God comes as a giver. Why does God come as a giver? Because guess what? He's got no needs. That's so simple, isn't it? Do you ever think about it? God doesn't need anything. Not a thing. He doesn't even need our praise. He needs nothing. He has everything. He lives in an infinite abundance, and he loves nothing more than to give generously. And he gave the very best. He gave his own son. Jesus, who was in the presence of the Father, living as the eternally begotten second person of the Trinity, in an infinite wealth of heaven, gave it all up, emptied himself, became poor in order, the Bible says, that we could become rich. That's the deal of the century. Don't you think? And that's how God gives. And it's not just how he wants to give to some special person. It's how he wants to give to you. So remember that. The gift of God's power. I'm going to translate it or focus on the fact of the gift of his power. But God gives extravagantly. Now we as people, we have a mentality of need or a poverty spirit. That's the opposite of God's abundance. How do we get that? God gave us everything. He put us in the garden. We had all this wealth, all this abundance, everything that we needed, but the devil came along and he did his number, which is he, show, he picked out that one thing we didn't have, that BMW. God gave me a Honda Civic. It's made in Canada, not bad. Drives very nicely, doesn't break down, but it's not a BMW with a fingerprint thing. See, that's what we're like, isn't it? God can bless you and provide for you, in, and not just financially, but in other different ways too. And then there's always somebody else that seems to have it better. And that's all we can see. And when that spirit comes in, we know that's not of God. It's of the devil. Because that's what Adam and Eve's problem was. And so they forgot and got their eyes off all that God had given they could only see that one thing that God said no. They reached out and tried to take it and lost everything. And ever since then, we've been living under the curse of a poverty spirit. A poverty spirit defines us as a people who never have enough. You can be the wealthiest people in the community and have a poverty spirit. John D. Rockefeller, who was the richest man in the United States, they asked him, Mr. Rockefeller, what was the best million you ever made? He said, the next. Never enough. Proverbs speaks about it. But God set us free from that. God wants to break the power of the mentality of need, of the poverty spirit, and he wants to bring us into an assurance of his supply. He wants, us to, he wants to help us stop focusing on what we don't have and start focusing on what he has given, each of us. And one of the things, this is my point, that he gives so generously is his power. This whole passage is about the gift of the power of God. And one of the most consistent ways that the devil will attack you or me today is, or the body of Christ is by suggesting that the power of God is not available. Power of God? Well, it was available back in Bible times. Jesus had it, yeah, but not for today. What's available in the revival that's going on in China or miracles that are going on in Africa or some other place, but not here. That's a lie. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Doesn't matter what country it is. Doesn't matter anything else, what time of history, period of history it's in. The power of God is available. It's, it is a lie contrary to the word of God. And the gift of God's power, Paul prays, is for you in the plural, which means... You, all, that's American, y'all. In Canada, we say yous, for yous. 
it's not just for me's, it's for you's, <laughs> for all of you. Even Brazilians have a little touch of it. They got quite a lot. Now, the gift of God's power. That's my first point. Remember that. The reality of the gift of the power. The second point is this. It's the source of God's power. He says God gives his gift of his power through his spirit. You can't separate the power of God from the spirit of God. You can't separate the power of God from the character of God. You can't have the power of God without having God, the Holy Spirit, living within you. And then we, we can sweat a little bit less about the whole issue we have with character versus charisma. We get so uptight about that uh, sometimes, I think. And I know there's loony, loopy, charismatic people running around and all the rest of it. That's true. But we worry and we think, well, God won't use us until our character has reached some epic place of maturity. That's a lie. As a matter of fact, and you may never have thought of it this way, and don't think I'm a false teacher, a heretic, or whatever, but you actually can't create your own character. It's a gift. See, we fall into a deception, I think. We believe that a miraculous gift uh, of healing, let's say, has got to be from God. We accept that. That can't be from us. It's from God. But how about patience? How about discipline when you're studying Bible school? Is it a gift? Do you have it yourself naturally? No. I remember when I was doing my PhD thesis, I just about died. I thought, I can't take this anymore. I'm totally burned out. And yet God said, you've got to do it. How did I do it? I asked for the power. See, power, I'm not suggesting you have any lack of patience. I'm sure you're the perfect student, Breno. <laughs> but the fact is that the moral character I have is also a gift from God. Is if, I, if it isn't a gift from God, it's something that I've created, and that's legalism, and it's impossible because I can't. And Christians wear themselves out trying to make themselves better. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, what's your role in it? You have to say yes. You have to say, yes, Lord, I'm willing. I want you to create character in me, but only God can do it. But the good news is when you have the Holy Spirit resident within you, you change. We were in, uh, when we were in England, one night we went to a meeting, I was speaking at it, of ex-convicts and their girlfriends who are mostly all former prostitutes. And we we're in this room full of the wildest worship you could just about ever imagine. I mean, these people threw themselves into it. And a lady said to Elaine, oh, that guy right beside you, he just got out last week. And I said, Hang on to your purse. <laughs> but these people had been changed. Some of them had only been Christians for days or weeks. They'd been changed. Were they perfect? No, they weren't perfect. But they were changed. I'll tell you what, they were going out and winning others to Christ. They weren't waiting until they reached perfect maturity before they did something for God. You think that's impossible. God won't use an imperfect person. Well, he'll use you. Are you perfect? I'll come and step in your toe, and you'll soon find out you aren't perfect. None of us is perfect. If we wait for perfection, we won't be perfect until we meet the Lord face to face, and then it's too late to be of any good on earth. Just step out. People ask me about hearing the voice of God and the prophetic, and I say this, and I hope it doesn't upset anyone, some of it is trial and error. You've got to step out somewhere. The first time you feel you've heard God for somebody else, you've got to step out somewhere. And the secret of it is you come in a place of humility. You don't say, God said. You just say, well, you know, I feel maybe the Lord was saying something like this. And you, then you throw it out and you say, you know, if you feel that that is accurate or somewhat accurate, and, and if not, that's fine. And then the person says, oh, my goodness, how did you know that? And then you know. 
you're on the right track. And the next time, you get a little bit more bold and a little bit more bold. And finally, there are times when I know instinctively God just speaks to me and the voice comes out of my mouth. And I think, who the heck said that? And it was me and it's too late. <laughs> I've said it, <laughs> you know. That's how we grow as imperfect people. When you, when you are, we have a, a grandson that's just started to walk and you know, the first time you have a, a little baby or a toddler or whatever, and they start to walk, they get up on their feet and take those first steps, and you're, you know, taking photographs and all the rest of it and whatnot. And, or if you're grandparents, you're busy stuffing cookies in their mouth while their parents aren't looking. <laughs> all the things that you never did when you were a parent. <laughs> you got to start somewhere is what I'm trying to say. I, this is, I, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit now. Well, I'm, I, I got away from my... But anyway, the first point is the gift of power, and the second point is the source of power. It comes through the Spirit. When you have the Spirit of God within you, then you can do all things. You don't have to be perfect. You have, but God, by His Spirit living within you, as He does, will change you whether you realize it or not. Just listen to the encouragement when people give encouragement to you. I am so grateful for when people encourage me. I am so grateful. It's so important. If you see something of Christ in somebody's life, go encourage them. They may need to hear that. And it encourages me that God is using me. Now, let's welcome the Holy Spirit. We, 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 want, to, we want to be a church and a people who are completely submissive and open to and welcoming of the Spirit of God, and we will never apologize for the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, I know it's figurative language. It's not just literal because it's impossible to apply some literal things to God. But the Bible says that God is seated on a throne and the Son is at His right hand. And the Spirit has been sent by the Father and the Son to indwell His people on earth. That means, according to my understanding, that the Holy Spirit is God on earth. Now, the, what the devil does is he tries to minimize the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is just the third person of the Trinity. He's a doctrine. Sometimes we even refer to the Holy Spirit as it, God forbid, but it happens. And so we need to realize if the Holy Spirit is not on earth, God ain't not on earth. We haven't got God anymore, and that's what the devil wants. So let's give the Holy Spirit a big place in our life and a big place in our church and re recognize that He is not just the assistant pastor to God. He is God. So the gift of power, God wants to give you the gift of power, and He's a great extravagant giver. Number one. Number two, the source of power is in the person of the Holy Spirit. Please welcome the Holy Spirit. And then He says... God gives, through His Spirit, power in the inner being, in the inner man, in the inner woman. Elsewhere, Paul describes that as in the Spirit, in our spirit. There is a place of safety in our inmost being where the Spirit of God comes and gives birth and life to my spirit, that eternal part of me, right? And God doesn't come and just put power in my emotions, or power in my intellect, or power in my physical body, or power uh, in my will. God puts it in a safe place in my spirit where His Spirit dwells. Imagine people who were supernaturally empowered in their intellect or in, uh, in their emotions, but, but it didn't come out of the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit in their spirit. But what happens is that in that safe place, God is resident within me. He then reaches out and He begins to redeem my emotions and change them and my mind and my thinking and my physical body. And He heals me and He works in all those parts of my life, but He deposits His power in the inner being, in the inner man, in the inner woman. Cultivate that place. It's real. It's, it's that. It is your spirit when you die should if, if before the Lord's return, the book of Revelation presents us as spirits 
who dwell in the presence of God awaiting the resurrection of the body. That's the eternal part of us. We are eternal beings. All people will live forever, either in heaven or in the lake of fire. It's not just a temporary thing. And God has put His Spirit and breathed life into your spirit. That's the location of power. So the gift of power, the source of power, the location of power, and here's the goal of power. It says, God, I'm praying that God may give you his power lavishly through his spirit in your inner being in order that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and you may know the light, height, length, breadth, and depth of the love of Christ. The goal of it all is that Christ may dwell within your hearts. I think that's an amazing thing. There's two Greek words for <clears throat> dwell. One is peroikain, the other is katoikain, and the word Peroikine means to be a resident alien. You know, when I was living in the United States as a student at seminary, I was classified, according to the card, as a resident alien. I didn't have antenna coming out of my ears or anything like that, but I wasn't a citizen. I was a citizen. My citizenship was in another place, but I was allowed to stay in order to study. I was a resident alien. And the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 1 and 1 uses the same word to say we are all resident aliens on earth because our true citizenship is in heaven. Now, that's the one word, but that's not the word that's used here. The word that's used here is the other word, which means a permanent dwelling. Someone said to me out of the first service, are you coming to dwell in that tent on the front yard? The weather could get cold. I said, no, I, said, oh, I hate camping. We've got a house, thank you, Lord, to live in. See, a permanent dwelling. And here's the good news, that Christ has come to make a permanent dwelling in your heart by faith. He ain't never going to leave. Never. I'm so, my theology has always been, since I was a young believer, that if you really, truly, genuinely were born again, you could never lose your salvation. And my logic was this. It says that I've been given eternal life. If I've been giving, given something that is eternal in nature, how can it be gone tomorrow? I, uh, like a politician's promise, you know? How can it be gone t tomorrow? No. My, I have life eternal within me. So do you. Christ, it says here, has come to make a permanent dwelling in your heart. So the goal of the power of God ultimately is that Jesus Christ would live forever in you and you would know his amazing love, the height and the depth and the breadth and the length of it. And have that dwelling within you. Isn't that amazing that God did that for you? You know, we all go through difficult times. But it's like I said, keep your eyes on what God did, has done for you. That's the Israelites. God kept saying, keep on remembering what God did. Keep on building little stone memorials to remember what God did. Put up your Ebenezer. There's a lot of names, old biblical names coming back. Ebenezer isn't one of them yet. But Ebenezer is a combination of two Hebrew words that means the stone of help. They put it up, a big stone. So every time they walked past it, they remembered God has helped us up to this very point. Put some Ebenezers out there in your life. We had friends who put stones in a jar in their dining room table every time God provided for them when they were going through a really difficult financial time, and the jar got full to overflowing. That was 25 years ago. I met them for lunch a year or two ago, and they said, our jar is still overflowing. God's faithful. Amen? And so that's the goal of power, that Christ may dwell forever in your heart through faith. And here's the result of power, the ultimate result. So God... God's goal is that Christ may live in your heart through faith, but the ultimate end of the whole thing is expressed in the last couple of verses. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power, there's the power, at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever. The ultimate goal, the ultimate result of everything that God does on planet earth is his own glory. For us, that would be selfish, but not for God, because he lives in perfect love. And, uh, you know, God 
did send Jesus to the cross to save us, but our salvation was not the ultimate purpose of what God did. That would be centering everything on us. The ultimate purpose of everything God does is that he himself be glorified. And we need to keep that in mind. It's not all about us. It's about him. And of course, when it's about him, we know how much he's given to us and whatever he would do for us is more than we can ever imagine or conceive. But we just need to keep that measuring stick in our minds. Everything that we do in this life should be for his glory. It's not about us. It's about him. It's a sobering thought. Do I glorify God in my life? The ultimate goal of the manifestation of the power of God is that God is glorified. People, when the, well, in various outpourings of the Spirit that, that we've witnessed, um, you know, sometimes there's a criticism, oh, it's just a big show. But no, not really, because there were always lives changed. God was always honored. I mean, I remember talking to a lady in England 30 years ago and uh, uh, talking about healing and the reality of healing, and she was offended by that. Uh, and uh, she said, you've reduced Christianity to, to a spectacle, just saying that God wants to go around healing people. I said, look, I said, ma'am, Jesus didn't heal people because he wanted to make a spectacle. Jesus healed people because he had compassion on them. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? And he loved them. And in the healing of those people, they glorified God. God was glorified in them. How many want God to be glorified in your life? You are a candidate for God to be glorified. Let me finish with this thought. Jesus, at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew, made this statement. We all know it's called the Great Commission. All power in heaven and earth has been given to me. And then the next words are his application. Go, therefore. In other words, all power has been given to me, but I'm giving it to you. Do something with it. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. How do you get that power and complete the mission? By faith. By faith we strive. By faith we make every e effort to take a hold of the promise. By faith we receive not only the power of God for miracles, but by faith we receive the character that we need to live to God's glory. Dr. David Livingston, the great missionary to Africa of uh, 150 or so years ago, and today his life's work can be credited probably with tens of millions of believers. Dr. Livingston, they went looking for him one day and they found him dead in the jungle on his knees with his Bible open in front of him. And his Bible was opened at these verses in Matthew 28. And the last verse he had underlined, Behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. And in the moment that Dr. Livingston, a man who had given up a great deal to do what he'd done, he walked in to the heavenly celebration. He had his name called out by the angels, he was ushered into the presence of God and entered into his reward, having extended the kingdom of God into a whole continent by faith because he knew and had received the gift of God's power. How many would like to receive something of that today? Now listen, listen to me. It's not about great personalities. In the first service, I pointed out an example I think I've mentioned here before, the shoe salesman in Chicago that took in the orphaned kids and fed them and, and taught them the Bible. And one little boy came to Christ. His name was D.L. Moody. Changed this nation and other nations for Christ. Through his ministry, eventually, a couple of generations of evangelists down, a young man called Billy Graham came forward and received Christ. And... Some years into Billy Graham's ministry, a young man in England came forward and received Christ. He went out to Canada. He preached the gospel at the University of Toronto, and a young guy called David Campbell heard that gospel for the first time. And I owe it all. I owe it all to some shoe salesman in Chicago whose name neither you nor I know. 
I even Googled it. I can't find it. So you might be that person. You might be that person. Never underestimate what God can do through you. You only need one qualification, the power of God, and he's given it to you. So maybe we could have several musicians up, and this time, Anne, Renee, Eddie, can we do the second last song that you did? I'm hopeless at remembering the names of songs. <laughs> what a wonderful name it is. Let's stand up, and while we're singing this song, open your heart to God and believe Him. If you want to come up and just pray at the front, if you want to have somebody pray for you before you leave to receive the power of God, but you can receive His power right there where you are. God can move and wants to move. Let's lift up our hearts to the Lord. Worship and rejoice in Him.